What I want to focus on in this video is whether or not stats really applies to um, our lives. And I would say this because when I've asked students in the past, especially at the beginning of the stats course, how they use stats in their lives, I get answers like this. So this person's talking about gas prices and saying, mm, maybe if I see the gas, price of gas go up, I could see if there are other factors that are making it spike. Uh, another person said, uh, actually several people think about stats as budgeting their money. Um, these are both, um, I don't know, I've, I've never used statistics for either of these two things. I think they could indirectly apply. Um, but when I think of stats, I think much more about relationships, uh, decision making, uh, health uh, issues, benefits. Um, much more so than some of these strictly quantitative things that we we might think of. so I, I do think they apply here um, but what i want to challenge you to do is is broaden your perception of, of how uh, they could apply so to give you an example and a, a specifically an example that shows that stats don't have to be complicated um, this is my daughter ellie up here and uh, we we had some, this was before COVID when we were trying to get ready for school every morning and it was chaotic, um, lots of screaming, crying, yelling. Uh, a lot of that revolved around breakfast choices with, um, we go with Ellie once or Katie once or Gian and I want. Um, and so Ellie's idea was actually to set up this little chart. Um, obviously she doesn't know much about statistics uh, but she set up a, a pretty nice way to gather data and um, it helped us figure out. We did this the night before. Uh, so in this particular case, I think it was cereal that we chose then for the next morning. And then we did this every every evening um, before the next morning. And it just made things go much smoother. So a very simple idea, very simple. To me, this is authentic statistics because it's collecting data and then analyzing and using that data. Um, that, to me, is what statistics is all about in a way that can impact your life. And this certainly impacted my life, made my mornings uh, much more enjoyable. I'm, I'm sure theirs, too. They weren't crying as much. Um, so what are some other things that stats could be used for? Well, one thing would be faith. So here I, I'm intentionally trying to pick areas that you might not necessarily connect with stats. So I can I can show you how they relate. Uh, let me give you one example. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of, there's journals, entire journals about how faith and using statistics to, to look at different aspects of faith. Um, there's, there's one optional spreadsheet assignment that you can do that looks about people changing their faith. So the religion you start in, how does that relate to a religion you end up in as an adult? And, and what religions are more likely to convert to another religion or no religion? Um, so this particular question that I was thinking of was a study where they looked at uh, a large group of volunteers and they divided them into three categories. So they had the people who um, basically said they had no faith, they didn't believe in anything. People who were very uh, religious, very uh, devoted and lived out whatever faith they believed in. And then a third group who did have a lot of beliefs, um, but didn't really live them out in their day-to-day -day life. So you had those three categories. And then with everyone in the study, they, they gave them a survey on happiness level. So there's, believe it or not, uh, there's several different surveys where you can somewhat measure someone's quality of life or general uh, enjoyment in life. And then they looked at those three groups and said, so what, what are the differences in average happiness? And you might pause this video for a few seconds and think to yourself, um, which, which group do you think was the happiest and the least happy? As it turns out, the group um, that was very religious and, and lived it out uh, was the happiest group, but just a sliver below them, and, and not even statistically significant, um, was the group that had no faith whatsoever and, and said they had no faith. So those two groups were both relatively happy. It was the group that had a lot of beliefs, um, but didn't li live them out on a day-to-day -day basis, that was very unhappy. Um, 
so I, I, I thought that's worth noting. And the researchers interpreted it as saying that um, the way that you live out your beliefs really impacts you on a subconscious level. It really uh, comes out in all kinds of, of ways. Now that's getting into some causation correlation things too. We'll, we'll talk about more about that later. But the point is, um, this was an example of looking at faith through a statistical lens. Um, athletics now have been dominated by statistics, especially professional athletics, but it's really moving down to the high school level uh, even, um, and certainly the college level. So you you might have seen a movie like Moneyball. We might talk about that later, where uh, basically the use of statistics transformed the entire game. And, and now if you watch a baseball game, when a batter hits a home run, you'll see a little pop-up that shows the angle, the distance, the velocity, all these kind of little stats. Uh, especially for pitchers, they'll show like where they tend to pitch the ball and what the batter's reaction is in each zone, uh, but basketball, tennis, field hockey, lacrosse, uh, any sport now can use a lot of statistics. And yes, love, uh, relationships in general, certainly, but even love. Um, this was one of my first statistical adventures uh, when I, I think I alluded to this in the $100 video. Um, but I, I had gone through a period of three or four years, kind of an embarrassing story. Uh, in my early 20s, after college, it's, it gets harder to meet people after college, meet new friends or, or relationships. And I'd gone on a couple dates, but it, it just wasn't really going very well. And, and a lot of my friends had gotten married. So I was kind of in this position where I was romantic and wanted to um, wanted to be in like a long term committed relationship, but uh, I couldn't seem to find any options. So I um, I decided to calculate that and went through a series of calculations that determined there were 7,212 uh, females in the U.S. that if I would find one of them would be suitable for marriage for me. Uh, and then there was a whole road trip uh, based around trying to like efficiently find one of those elusive 7,212. Mm -hmm. And again, stats was used there in, in terms of the places that I, I would go, the used bookstores, the coffee shops. Um, it ended up that I didn't meet my wife on that road trip. But again, it was an example of using uh, statistics to look at an area. Um, so it's, it's basically just any way that we can learn from data. And it, it is a science. It's very calculated, but it does have some artistic feel to it also. And I think you'll see that as we go through the course. Um, so let me just return to that, that question of, of finding true love um, and look at it again in a statistical perspective. Um, we'll look more at this later. It gets pretty interesting actually. here. Here's an example of a way that you could use statistics to try to find someone some, a match for you. So what they've done is they they used census data, I believe, to plot these. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you pause this maybe and just look at this and try to figure out what's going on first and what are the stories and then unpause and you can hear what I think. Okay. Well, first of all, the title tells us a lot. So metros, we're talking about urban areas here, not rural areas, and that could influence stories here. Uh, we're looking at single. So this is not just the ratio of men to women. This is specifically looking at ones that are unmarried, I believe is their, their defi definition of single. Um, and it's a specific age group. So it's this adult age group, um, but not senior citizens. Uh, somewhere between eight or and then we have these two colors the blue and the pink the bigger the dot the more that particular urban area the more single men that particular area has the bigger the pink dot the more single women that has um so what are some of the stories we see here in this graph well one that i certainly see is western u.s tends to be a lot more blue and eastern u.s tends to be a lot more pink um, so what does that mean in plain English? Well, it means that the cities west of the Mississippi 
tend to have an excess of single men, whereas the cities east of the Mississippi or the eastern half of the United States uh, tend to have a lot more single women in the cities. Um, I would also start to wonder some questions about New York, size of New York, and this is just the raw number of additional single women. Um, but I'd want to somehow factor in the size of the city, and I think we'll do that uh, in a different exercise. But for now, realizing that, okay, well, if, if you wanted to move somewhere after you graduate college and you were looking for a relationship with a man, um, maybe the West would be a better place to go if you're looking for a relationship with a woman. Um, perhaps the East would be better. Now, again, we have to dive into that data a little. Those are kind of the stories on the surface. Um, but it shows you again how statistics could relate with relationships. So the main point is uh, statistics really could be used for any areas of our life, but especially for any kind of decision making, predictions, uh, relationships. It's really good for studying human behavior uh, because math can fall short there. Math has exact, precise and that's not how human relationships often are. They're messy. Um, they deal more with probability of sometimes this happens, sometimes this. And stats is perfectly suited for those kinds of problems. Okay, so keep an open mind. And I hope you can learn a lot about how stats connects with all areas of our, our lives.